Thanks, everybody, for joining. This is Bill Van Orsdell on the Self-Publishing Wednesday webinar from WaveCloud. Today, we're going to talk about book descriptions. Uh, of course, the title of today's webinar is Hook Line, Log Line, and Sinker, I mean, and Summary, and why these are not the same thing. Really, what I'm going to do uh, as, as efficiently as we can over the next 55 minutes is uh, go ahead and talk about book descriptions in general, uh, the differences between fiction and nonfiction. So let's, look, let's go ahead and get started. As we get started, I want to let everybody on the call know that I'm recording this for playback later. So if you have to leave in the, in the middle of the presentation because something happens, you've got to go somewhere, um, uh, we'll have a, you'll receive a link tonight around midnight, uh, probably Pacific time, that will give you a link to playback to see the rest of the presentation. Of course, you'll have the audio and the video. I am more than happy to send these slides to anyone who'd like to ask. Just send me an email, bill.vanorsdell at wavecloud.com. And, of course, let's just sort of set our assumptions. You are planning to or you have already self-published your book. You are marketing your book. You're, you're in the middle of driving traffic to your sales pages. And those sales pages could be on your, uh, your Author Anchor website. They could be on your Amazon book sales page. They could be on your Barnes & Noble page. Uh, people could be looking at your book description in the Apple Store. Um, any of those I consider to be your sales pages. And I'll just throw one more in here uh, because I am not a professional copywriter. I'm going to assume that none of us are none of us on the call are professional copywriters either. And we'll uh, we'll talk about why that's, why that's important in a minute. Uh, a quick word from our sponsor um, from WaveCloud. This is not a sales pitch. This is a how to do it. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a how to do. I'm not going to show you how to put HTML tags in your book description to make it pop. I'm not going to show you how to change a sentence so that it juxtaposes the protagonist and the antagonist setting up the conflict in your book description. This is more about what to do. Um, um, none of the things that we're going to show require a PhD or an IT degree or an MFA. Um, I think there are, that all of the things we're going to talk about can be done by authors themselves, uh, and so that's what we want to focus on. WaveCloud, of course, is a, a publishing company uh, in the in the in the self-publishing sense of the word. We offer services, uh, and we're launching this great new product in about a week or two called Book Fuel. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it, but I'm going to tell you if you are self-publishing a book, you should uh, you should check this thing out. Our goal as a company is helping writers become successful authors. That's our number one priority: how you can become a successful author and do this over and over and over again. So I always start with the key points. I know that uh, most people, when they're watching presentations, they pay attention for about the first five minutes, and then they kind of drift off and do other things. And then at the very end, when I say we're wrapping up, you come back and pay attention again. So I'm going to give you all the key points, all of the conclusions right now, so that if you drift off, uh, at least you've had a chance to see the end before we get there. A good book description helps sell your book. There is no doubt about it. A bad book description will turn people off. Uh, there are a number of reasons why your book description could be described as bad. Um, but it's part of your sales process. Fiction and nonfiction descriptions have different formulas. They have different elements involved in what should be in your book description. We'll talk about that. Fiction book descriptions hook the browser or the consumer with emotion, usually. Your fiction book is trying to elicit an emotion. It could be curiosity. It could be passion. It could be um, a fear. But you're trying to use an emotion to get someone to impulse buy your book, to buy it right now, right after reading that book description. Nonfiction descriptions are different. They usually hook with solutions. Um, most, and we'll talk, there's one exception here, we'll talk about it, but nonfiction um, uh, book descriptions really need to be designed to uh, be a solution to a problem. Hopefully a narrow enough problem that you've got credibility and interest from a target market, but a broad enough problem that enough people will buy your book so that you can make money and write another one. You should add supportive reviews to your descriptions as they come in. I have a lot of authors who tell me, you know, I've got, I've got reviews on my Facebook page. I've got uh, people have sent me nice notes about my book in email, but not many people write Amazon reviews. Well, you're not alone when that happens to you, but there is a way to use those in your book description, and we'll talk about that. You should definitely test your book descriptions on, on your fans. You could even make it sort of part of the marketing experience, the pre-launch experience, and you need to refresh them periodically. There's, there's a few other tips and tricks we'll talk about when we get down to item number six in the presentation, but definitely refresh them periodically and test them out on fans. And when I say fans, the kind of people that you want, that you're expecting are in your target market to read your book. 
And then it, I, we talked about this in prior seminars, but I'll talk about it right here at the very end, and I'll show you an example of how formatting your book description uh, can really make it pop and hop off the page and really look good. And so I'll show you what I mean by that. Why does this matter? <clears throat> why, why should we invest an hour of our time in it? Book descriptions are an important part in the consumer buyer behavior chain. Right, so part step one is awareness. People have to become aware that you have a book out there. Step two is interest, and interest on your book sales page is driven by two pieces. And this is not unlike the experience that you have when you go into a bookstore. Your book cover, for a lot of reasons, drives interest. And then once people are interested enough in your book cover, usually they'll scroll down on your page, or if it's not below the fold, they'll read your book description. Your book description is a very important part in the chain of interest. And then if they liked your, your description, typically they'll either try your book, they'll read a few pages, or they'll look at your reviews as a substitute for trial and hopefully go on to purchase. So it's a critical step. Having a great, compelling book description <coughs> is absolutely important. When you write a very good book description, it's going to have multiple uses. You can use it online in your uh, online bookstore. So uh, everywhere that sells the print or the ebook version of your book will have an opportunity for you to put a book description in. Because book description is a piece of metadata that travels with your book everywhere. In fact, uh, in the Bowker world, they have a space for, for uh, book description. In fact, I believe they even have a space for short description and long description. So description is absolutely a piece of metadata. You can use it online everywhere your book is sold. In print, your book description should either be word for word exact or very close to what is on the back of your book because they say they serve the same purpose. The book description on your Amazon page is designed to make someone who has picked up your book and looked at the back of it, i.e. scroll down to the right part of the Amazon page, to actually go ahead and purchase your book. You're trying to give them an incentive to purchase your book. And of course, when you do marketing, when you're um, telling people about your book, when you are describing to them verbally, when you are tweeting about it, a good, direct, impactful book description can make a difference. And again, you write one good one and you can retask it for mul multiple purposes. And I mentioned before, you know, con typical consumer be buyer behavior, whether in a, it's in a store or online, at the interest stage, they look at your cover. If they like your cover, they'll pick it up and they'll look at the back of your book. Too much description is as bad as too little description. Um, there are readers out there, especially in the fiction world, who they don't want to know too much about your book. They don't want to know how it ends. They don't want to know what happens in Act 2 or the beginning of Act 3. They want to know really simple, basic stuff. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, and I, I frankly, uh, I don't think I've seen a book description that was too short. Um, it's very rare for a writer when describing their own book to be too short about it. It can happen if you ask somebody else to write your book description. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that. Book descriptions set the hook, right? They drive consumers to trial or purchase. They sell more books. That's why we care about book descriptions. So let's talk about the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And by the way, I want to say this. Um, I'd like to make this uh, absolutely as interactive as possible. So if you want to interrupt me with a question, I'm watching my question board. So if another question comes in, I'll be happy to acknowledge your question and try to answer it right there, or we'll, we'll put it in the parking lot for afterwards. But uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, it actually gives me a chance to take a little sip of water, so it's not bad. So acknowledge this. You may not be. Uh, good or bad. There's, there's, just because you wrote a book, it doesn't necessarily make you a great copywriter. In fact, it's, it's kind of hard to write a book description for yourself. Um, although I tell all writers that they need to do it for themselves. It's almost impossible to hire someone for a reasonable price to do it for you. You can certainly hire an editor to look at your book description, especially one who's been with you and editing your book all, all, all the way through, to give you some feedback and some suggestions for improvement. But fundamentally, remember this, if you spend a year or two years writing your book and you know everything about it, you are absolutely the best person to write your, your book description. It's like an elevator pitch for a new job. You don't just write it once and you're done. You've got to practice it. You've got to rewrite it. I mean, this is the thing that is, that is critical to selling more books. Don't think that you're going to get away with spending an hour or two hours writing this. Don't think you'll get away with not editing this piece. Don't think you'll get away with not showing this to some of your fans. You've got to work on it. You can't just toss it off and say, okay, I'm done. Now, the fiction formula elements for writing a book description are different than the elements that go into the nonfiction 
formula. So let's talk about them. In, in a fiction world, your book description should have many, if not most, of these elements. Although it doesn't have to have all of them, and there's no hard, fast rule here. But generally, readers are looking for a setting, an inciting incident, a protagonist, a conflict, sometimes the antagonist, and then you want to end that description with a hook. And I'm going to show you a good example of one that I like. Uh, I believe it's for Random House. Um, but nonfiction is very different. Nonfiction doesn't have that set of elements. And I would suggest that you need at least four out of the five elements for nonfiction. So that's your benefit promise, your unique selling proposition, your expert credentials, and some testi testimonials. Now I'll go into much more detail about all of those elements uh, a little bit in a few different sli in a few more slides. But first, I want to talk about a special case, um, which doesn't fit this easy formula very well, and that's narrative nonfiction. So this is memoirs, historical nonfiction, reality books. Um, I would argue that you should think about your book description using the fiction formula elements for narrative nonfiction rather than using nonfiction formula elements. Let me let me talk about why. Next week we're going to be doing a I think it's actually not not next week, not next time, which is two weeks away, but a month from today we're going to be doing a webinar with uh, Philippa Burgess and actually some of this material I borrowed from her. Um, she has been in Hollywood for I think 20 years, 25 years, um, helping turn <clears throat> uh, writing and book properties into TV shows and movies. And we're going to give a seminar in a month about how to tune, how to craft, how to, what to do to your story either before or after you've, uh, after you, thanks, thanks, Christine, I had memoir spelled improperly. Um, after you've uh, written your book um, about how to turn it into a Hollywood property. And uh, she divides those pro those books into four categories real world fiction speculative fiction narrative nonfiction and general or prescriptive nonfiction so take a look at the moment at this slide and I want you to tell me what which what category does your book fall into I'm curious about for all the people that we have on the seminar today tell me what category your book falls into and I'm just gonna do this with a poll so that we can all see examples of what everybody else thought about their book so if you would just take a moment Remember what those four categories were, real, real world fiction, speculative fiction, narrative nonfiction, and general or prescriptive nonfiction, and uh, click one of the radio buttons on this screen and let me know um, what kind of book you have. And I'd be very happy if nobody clicks other. <laughs> All right, I think about half of us have voted. If the other half of you are still paying attention, I'd appreciate just a quick vote. And Christine, sorry, I, I swear I used Google Fight to try and spell uh, memoir, and I probably should have used a style guide instead. <laughs> all right, we've almost all voted. I think there's just about 15% of us left to go. I'll close out the poll and share it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So our audience today um, looks like it's a pretty good split. We're, we're all over the place. We've got uh, real world and speculative fiction, but um, some narrative nonfiction as well. Okay, so let's talk about this special case for narrative nonfiction and book descriptions and, and what to do. Let me hide our poll real quick. Okay, <clears throat> so what I've done is I've colored the slide. If, if, you're, if your book follows, falls in the red zone, use the fiction formula. If it falls in the blue zone, use the nonfiction formula. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, what is in the, fiction, in, the, in the fiction formula? Your setting, your inciting incident, your protagonist, your conflict, your antagonist. And then you set an emotional hook. Here's an example. I thought this one was pretty good. I, uh, I'm going to actually read it out loud, but I'm going to stop at each point where I think we've got one of the elements in here. So Will Robbie. Uh, so this is from David Balducci, number one best-selling author and one of the world's most popular widely read storytellers. Comes the most thrilling novel of the year, The Hit. <clears throat> now, we could argue about whether those first three lines of that book description do anything for me or not. I think they do. They don't follow our formula very well. But let's start with line four. Will Robbie is a master of killing. Okay, it seems pretty clear that I either have the protagonist or the antagonist right here. Highly skilled assassin. Robbie is the man the U.S. government calls on to eliminate the worst of the worst enemies of the state. Monsters committed to harming untold numbers of innocent victims. That's a pretty good... Um, 
pretty detailed description of who I think our protagonist is going to be, maybe even too much. We'll talk about that in a moment. No one else can match Robbie's talents as a hitman. No one except Jessica Real. Okay, so now I probably got maybe the antagonist. A fellow assassin, equally professional and dangerous. Real is every bit as lethal as Robbie. And now she's gone rogue, turning her gun sights on other members of their agency. Okay, so it sounds like I've got the conflict. To stop one of their own, the government looks again to Will Robbie. His mission, bring in real dead or alive. I definitely have the conflict now. Only a killer can catch another killer, they tell him. But as Robbie pursues Real, he quickly finds that there is more to her betrayal than meets the eye. Her attacks on the agency conceal a larger threat. Up, oh, sounds like I might have the hook. A threat that could send shockwaves to the U.S. government and around the world. Okay, so maybe I've got a little um, mystery on my hands. I've got a thriller on my hands. I'm, I'm trying to set, some, uh, uh, set the emotional hook there. So I clearly, I don't have the setting, although perhaps around the world is a good, um, a, a, is a good description of the setting. My inciting incident, it clearly must be either when uh, Real goes rogue or when they hire Robbie to come get her. I've got the protagonist, I've got the conflict, I've got the antagonist, and they've, they've done a decent job at setting an emotional hook. So, you know, here's a book description that hits most of the highlights of the formula. I think it's a pretty good, a good description. I especially like that it's so short. Um, again, we could, we could probably have a good argument about whether these top three lines from David Balducci, the number one best-selling, all the way down to retype, re-articulating uh, the title of the book. Um, but that's an ex a pretty good example of of uh, an execution of uh, a fiction book description. And so you think about that with your book uh, and even your narrative nonfiction book. So you've got a narrative nonfiction book. Maybe it's a memoir. Um, you know, you've got to introduce the main character, the conflict that he or she or you went through, um, and the question. You know, what was the question, the, the driving element that makes this story interesting and entertaining for others? So clearly for a memoir, which is nonfiction, I'm, I could have some pretty good traction using a fiction formula. Let's talk about the nonfiction formula. I'm actually going to go about this one a little bit differently than the other one. So uh, uh, I think that there are at least four elements to your nonfiction formula. You've got to have your benefit promise. In fact, all the authors I talk to, I recommend that their benefit promise be on the front of the book and be repeated on the back of the book. Uh, <clears throat> so an example of a, of a benefit promise would be lose 40 pounds in 40 days. Or, you know, learn the Hollywood star's secrets for looking young and staying fit and trim and, and making me envious. Okay, it's one thing to have a benefit promise. Anyone can promise to help you lose 40 pounds in 40 days. What's unique about your book, your solution, your prescriptive remedy in this nonfiction world and that's where, you know, I'm, again, I'm making this up. Using, using these 40 unique soap, soup recipes, um, eating soup all day. So that's pretty unique. I haven't seen a book like that yet. Uh, with exclusive interviews with Hollywood stylists. Okay, so if I'm trying to learn the secrets of how these Hollywood stars stay so young looking, I probably want to talk to the professionals that dress uh, them every day. Um, and now here's my expert credentials. I'm a Michelin Guide chef. Uh, I've worked at a number of five-star restaurants. Uh, these are award-winning recipes. Or uh, my credentials are, hey, I went and interviewed all of the top stylists in Hollywood, and here are their tricks. And then testimonials. Uh, this, is, this is more common after your book has been out for a while, um, although I would recommend that you probably don't want to launch without testimonials because if you have a prescriptive system for self-improvement, um, there's a decent chance that you've already tried it out on someone. You've already had uh, readers or people who... who uh, who you coach or you consult with that have used your system and lost their 40 pounds or now they look younger. Uh, so testimonials, I think, are an important element even at your launch. I wouldn't put more than two in my book description. I'm sorry, I wouldn't put more than four in my book description, and I'd, I'd probably do at least I'd probably do at least two. Example of a testimonial, you know, I lost my 40 pounds, and I never felt hungry. That's skinny mini. She's, she's uh, I don't think you get a before and after picture of her, but maybe you could. Maybe in her review of the book she would. Uh, or after my style makeover, I've been invited on a lot more dates, you know, from an online dating um, veteran. So, you know, I made up the name Skinny Mini and the title Online Dating Veteran, but and I don't mean to be facetious, but you may end up doing that in your testimonials uh, because uh, Skinny Mini may not want to be identified as Skinny Mini. She might want to be Skinny M or Bill V or Jane S. Same thing's true for your style makeover person. They probably want to, they may want to remain anonymous. And you shouldn't feel bad about that. You know, this is not a um, 
This is not a legal situation, uh, but you definitely want to throw some testimonials into your book cover at the end. And I talked, you know, testimonials are a little bit like supportive reviews, and I think that they're that they are um, worth adding uh, to any book description, especially at the end. Um, again, you'll you'll get lots of reviews as you bring your book out. People who just don't or can't uh, don't want to or can't leave you an Amazon review, but they'll put one up on your Facebook post, or they'll send you an email of how this changed their life, or kept them up all night, or they finished it in one weekend. It was a real page turn turner. So you want to go to those fans and you want to ask their permission, of course, and only use the yes responses. But you've got to be careful. You've got to be aware of the show more button. Here's an example of a review I pulled out of Amazon for the book called The Goldfinch, which was one of last year's most uh, popular 100 books on Amazon, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, right? So, you know, again, a little bit like the hit, uh, this traditional publisher has started off this review with a uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and with a review, uh, a blurb, it's not so much a review, but it's a blurb from Stephen King uh, in the New York Times Book Review. And you don't get to the description of this fiction, fictional story until you're halfway down through this review. And then before you can get to where the hook has been set, before you can find out more about um, the, the, the story or the elements that you want to have in your book description, I've got a show more button. And the problem is that when you hide your content behind a show more button, you are going to lose, the numbers are all over the place, truly, but you're going to lose some people. So you're going to lose, you could lose as, as little as 5% of the people who are browsing your book description and who were interested in your book but who are too lazy to click on show more, or you could lose 60% of them. And, and actually, you know, what, Bill, what, how, how do I know what's the difference between 5 and 60%? How will I know will I, will I lose them? Well, I would submit to you that, you know, if you start off with, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and a blurb from Stephen King, most people are probably going to click show more to see the rest of your book description. But if you don't have those kind of accolades, accolades and you haven't won those prizes, and you don't have a blurb from a, a New York Times sort of universally recognized best-selling author, your loss is going to be more like 60%. So if you create a book description that's so long, or at least it can't get through the basics of your formula uh, without the sh having the show more button, I'm going to suggest that you might want to rethink the length of that book description. Testing with your fans. So uh, in the same way that I recommend to authors that they test their book cover with their fans while they are producing their book to generate pre-launch and maybe even pre-order excitement, I would say the same thing's true with your book description. Right? They're the two things that generate the most interest on your book sales page. And when you did it with your book cover, you, your book cover artist probably gave you back three different ideas or six different crazy ideas. None of them were finished. Some of them even had watermarks on them. But you went and you posted them as a poll to your fan base. You said, everybody, I need some feedback. Of course, you're doing this to your fans because these are the people who are most likely to buy your book and who are looking for your kind of book from you. Um, and you ask them, which one of these covers looks good? Well, I would do the same thing with description. You know, if you're going to take two wildly different approaches to the way your book description looks, get some feedback from your fans and use it to generate a little pre-launch excitement. Also, and I think we're going to, in the future, we're going to do a webinar on this in, greater, in much greater depth, but when you post your book on Amazon and some other sites, you get the opportunity to create keywords or key phrases. And you don't, I don't, you know, I don't want you when you upload your book or just or write out your metadata to just sort of, oh, here's a box and it's asked me for seven keywords. Okay, well, let's see, um, let's see, science fiction that should be a keyword, apocalypse that should be a keyword, killer virus that should be a key phrase. Um, uh, uh, well, the name of my series is um, uh, Tale of the End, so I should put that in my key phrases. I don't, want, I don't want that to be your approach to your key phrase and keywords. You need to spend some time, and I'm going to suggest that the amount of time you spend may be as long as a day, so several hours, looking up the keywords and key phrases, especially if you have a nonfiction book, that people are searching on to find your book and make sure that, they, that not only are those sitting in the keywords or key phrases in your Amazon metadata, but that you also use those keywords and key phrases in perhaps your title, but 
definitely in your description. And the reason is simple. When people type in uh, something in the book title in Amazon, right, when they go to here, right, to, to, to search for your book, they're literally doing a keyword search, right? They're using Amazon to look up, um, you know, I'll, I'll pop up a new Amazon page real quick, show you how important this can be. So how to lose 40 pounds. All right, here we go. How to lose 40 pounds or more in 30 days with water fasting. Okay, it doesn't sound as much, as much fun as the soup diet that I made up, but, you know, here's somebody who's got a book out there who clearly, um, let's see, keep it off. I bet that's a key phrase that they went and researched. Um, fasting, smart eating is probably another huge key phrase that people are using when they search for uh, books on weight loss. So this author, Robert Dave Johnson, who's not a wave cloud author, as far as I know, um, went out and did some significant keyword research and then also probably threw some of these keywords in here, in this book description. So, you know, going back to our presentation, I want you to also do the keyword research so that judiciously sprinkled throughout your book description are the keywords and key phrases that people are looking for when they're looking for your fiction or looking for your nonfiction. And, and there's a whole, you know, again, we could do a whole webinar on what are the tools that I use, Uber Suggest, Google Analytics, uh, the search bar on Google, the search bar on uh, on Amazon. So, but you, you got to spend some time learning that and doing that. You should update your description periodically. And so not only are you updating it to check for the effectiveness of different approaches to the way you write out your description, but as you get reviews, um, as you get awards, you know, if you win the Pulitzer Award or if you win an award from the local library or you win, win the whatever award, you want that to be added to your book description. Um, also, if you hit number one in your Amazon category, there's nothing wrong with saying that, uh, with, with adding that to your book description. I think it's a pretty powerful uh, element in your book description. Also, you need to be careful when you're uploading multiple versions of your book. Make sure, where appropriate, that your book description for your ebook and for your print book or your print-on-demand book and your audio book are all harmonious and, and usually probably the same. Your audio book might have some nice words about the narrator, the other artist involved in that work, especially even if it was you. But the point is, um, it's very easy to accidentally or on purpose update the Amazon KDP description of your book and forget to go back and update the CreateSpace description of your book. Because CreateSpace up uploads one description and Amazon will keep your KDP description and they'll be different. And I can't think of a good reason to do that. Okay, so Christine says, so many new authors want to do the last thing you reference. Their description of their book is, if you like The Hunger Games and you enjoy reading YA books and you'll love my book, please tell us why you think it's a bad idea. Okay, Christine, thanks. So the last thing which I say is, don't reference other authors or books, or it should be books, in your description. And that the answer is very simple, and I, Christine may know this already. Amazon has a policy, and if you uh, uh, start trying to hook your book uh, onto the uh, tail, the coattails of another author, they will just wipe your book out from the store altogether. Now, so are they are they uniformly enforcing this draconian policy? Um, I think they're getting around to it. We certainly know that if you were to try to use, um, say, Hunger Games uh, in your YA dystopian novels key phrase section, uh, behind the scenes in Amazon, they'll they'll definitely whack it uh, then. So the bottom line is, you you it's perfectly fine if in a review one of reviewers says this game this book was better than the Hunger Games or this book reminded me of the Hunger Games or this book was just like the Hunger Games. <clears throat> but don't do it in your own book description. Don't do it in your key phrases and your keywords because Amazon will just pull your book from the store and uh, they could end up closing your account. It's pretty drastic. Um, if you search, uh, Penny Sansevieri has a, a pretty good article about this uh, in one of her blogs about facing this problem for one of her customers. She's a, uh, uh, a pretty well-known marketing guru, and she had to send an, an email to the dreaded... Uh, uh, Jeff at uh, Jeff Bezos at uh, Amazon.com to get a response and get her client's book restored 
to Amazon because they they invoked the policy without sort of giving everybody a lot of warning. So don't hook yourself onto other authors or, or their book titles, either in your description or in your um, in your keywords. Thanks, Christine, for for uh, helping me emphasize that. The last thing I want to point out is that I think it's pretty important that you format your description. I've talked about this on a couple of other uh, webinars, and uh, I, I know this doesn't have much to do with the content or the formula for what goes into your description, but I think that it's pretty important. Here is the description that we read earlier from The Hit by David Baldacci. And I think, and all I did is I took, I literally took the review, uh, I'm sorry, I took the book description, and let's just go back and look at it real quick. So I took this book description and literally copy and pasted it. Uh, I did a little, a few things from Amazon into this tool from Author Marketing Club. So this is what it looks like right now in Amazon. And, and you know, I didn't change it because I don't have the rights to, nor, nor would I want to. Um, but this is whatever David Baldacci's publisher, this is how they put their the book description in for the hit. Well, without hardly trying, I think this book description looks a lot better. Right, I'm using some of Amazon's colors. Uh, I have the chance to do some font stuff. I could do a lot more bullets. Um, you get a good separation between the sentences. I frankly, I don't even know if I broke the sentences correctly. Um, they made the the book description that Random House put in for his book may actually have meant not to have some breaks in between these sentences. But this tool is available on. There shouldn't be a space between use. There should be a space. It's AuthorMarketingClub.com. It's not use Author Marketing Club. It's AuthorMarketingClub.com. They have a free trial. It's not really a free tool. I think it's a 10-day or 30-day trial. Um, we're not related to Author Marketing Club. We don't get any money from them. We don't do any referrals. But I really like a lot of the things they do. And this tool, and I barely scratched the surface of what I could have done with this review, but this tool called the Amazon Enhanced Description Maker is found on their website. And it's a great way to enhance either your fiction or your nonfiction tool. Now, Edna Lynn said something said, oh, she has to go. All right, no worries. Um, so I would definitely take a look at formatting your description. Uh, this is a pretty powerful tool, um, and you can do a lot with it. Um, now, I will say one thing about formatting your description that's important for you to know. So what the Author Marketing Club tool does is they give you back a, uh, a little a section of text, and it has no breaks. It has no spaces. Well, I mean, it has a few spaces. But it looks weird, and plus it has these, if you're not familiar with these, HTML tags in it. So uh, uh, it's, uh, let's see, it's uh, less than slash H greater than, uh, less than slash B greater than. So it lets you create headlines and bold and italics. It essentially gives you a very small, Amazon gives you the rights to use a very small subset of HTML code that it embeds within the text of your book description and all you do is you literally cut and paste that little section and there's a video it tells you author marketing club tells you how to do this in their video right into your KDP book description okay easy piece of cake but here's the tricky part you're probably going to want to take that same subset and copy it into your create space print on demand book description that won't work because CreateSpace offers an even more limited subset of HTML tags as allowable tags. So you actually have to remove a few of the tags so that they look the same, um, so that the CreateSpace and the Amazon descriptions have the same format. Okay, so let's run back through the final descriptions, and then I want to open up a couple of descriptions that uh, the authors on the call were nice enough to share with me so we can just take a look at them and see what we think. So again, a good book description helps you sell your book. Fiction and nonfiction book descriptions follow different formulas. I recommend that if you have narrative nonfiction, that you're going to use the fiction formula to sell it. Um, use a hook, an emotional hook, uh, at the end of your fiction descriptions to, to, to convince your audience, I've got to find out if he saves the world. I've got to find out if he gets the girl. I've got to find out if the dragon um, survives past uh, egg hood. Um, Nonfiction descriptions, that's about a benefit promise. It's uniqueness, your, your credible authority, and the testimonial support of others. As your book is up there for a while, keep updating your description, add helpful reviews um, from your, from, even from amateurs, add little blurbs from them, just a sentence or two, um, but keep your, your description fresh, keep experimenting with it. 
when you're creating your book description, and it's going to take you time. It's not something you write in an hour. It may take you a couple of days. Um, if you're working with an editor, uh, you definitely want to connect with that editor and share with them what you're trying to accomplish. I'm sure they'll be very supportive. Test those descriptions on fans. And then once, you're, once it's text perfect, once you're ready, format that for na maximum impact so that once you've got the description up there, it looks good. It looks like it's part of the page. It looks professional. It looks well done. All right. Uh, I'm not, I won't take all of the rest of our time, but I, let's take at least 10 minutes. I'd like to look at a couple of the descriptions that you all were nice enough to share. So let's take a look at Judy Garwood's book, um, Amy, Queen of the Pirate's Ball. Okay, so here's, Amy's, uh, here's Judy's book description for Amy, Queen of the Ball. And, of course, she's got show more. It's only a tiny bit, so I wonder if there are things that Judy could do to maybe eliminate just a sentence or two that we don't need in here to help um, make this a not a show more, show less situation. So Amy, an 18-year-old girl, was rescued from the Irish seas uh, following the sinking of a cruise ship that drowned her mother and father. Amy's Aunt Lily, watching the family home, has been searching for her for the past 13 years. Okay, so I've got Amy, uh, who's going to be clearly, uh, my I'm guessing, my protagonist. Uh, I don't know if the sinking of the ship was the inciting incident, um, but let's keep reading. Amy must reign before she turns 19 as Queen of the Pirates Ball at Mardi Gras. She's two short weeks away. If she doesn't reign, a curse will come to pass, and the French Quarter will sink below the waters of the Mississippi River. Okay, well, right there, I've got a pretty good emotional hook. Um, I need her to reign. I need to find out if she's going to make it or if the French Quarter is going to sink. So that's pretty interesting to me already. And I, and I think I already know from working with Judy that this is a YA-focused book. Um, so I, I kind of like the level of the language we've got in here. Amy's befriended by Jimmy O'Brien, a 300-year-old leprechaun with magic powers, and a grandmother, Serena, the witch who put the curse on Amy's family over 150 years ago. She's befriended by the leprechaun and the witch. I, for a moment there, I thought we were going to see Serena as the um, antagonist, and that would be our conflict. Okay, Serena's enemies plot to harm Amy and thus avenge a grievance against Serena. Okay, so now I know who the antagonists are, and it looks like we've got some conflict. They're trying to get rid of Amy. And now it's a race for Amy to fulfill a destiny or fall into the hands of despicable characters who roam the hidden places in the magical French Quarter. Wow, you could stop right there um, because it's a race now. I, it's a, it's a, you know, we've said a fiction time bomb. I don't know what the end of it is, but the point is it's a race. Oh, before she turns 19 is the time bomb. So Amy needs to fulfill her destiny or bad things happen to her. What happens next? So I've, I've almost ended on the cliffhanger. Now, she finishes up with their real pirates and curses and treasure hunts, explore the... Um, uh, so I think that if you, you know, Judy, if you wanted to, you could probably get away with... It uh, looks like you could almost perfectly get away with um, just ending here at the French Quarter. But, of course, you know, I'm not a professional copywriter, and um, it's best to have good advice from an editor before we do anything. All right, let's just real quick take a look at... Uh, Judy's paperback version, the print-on-demand version, and looks, look at her description there and see if, they, if we see any difference. Okay, I immediately see some differences. So one of the differences I see is that um, her paperback description is one giant block of text. No breaks, uh, and so I'm assuming that her ebook version of her description has been edited with appropriate line breaks in between the paragraphs. So one of the things I would ask is uh, if it's intentional to have a different paperback description than to have an ebook description, uh, and my guess is that it may not be. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Thanks so much for sharing that with us, Judy. I really appreciate it. Let's take a look at Johan's book. So Polynesian Dreams, uh, an epic memoir, it takes us around the world as you follow the story of Johan, beginning 1940 as a startled 10-year-old, witnesses the German invasion and destruction of his home in Holland. Great. So now we've already been introduced to... Uh, the protagonist, that's Johan. We've got the inciting incident when he witnesses the German invasion. Okay, what happens next? Continuing into the long adventure of his youth, Johan, the tale that captivates and draws the readers close. In 1950, Johan, now a young man, emigrates, soon drafted in the military police. He's stationed for duty in Germany. He's discharged and has trouble in his life. Bankrupted financially, morally, point of physical collapse, asks himself what went, what went wrong. Fights his way back to health. All right, so now at the end, I've got maybe a benefit statement. We get to hear, we grow to hear our own inner voices more clearly. 
in great vivid prose. Okay, so I'd say a couple things about this description. The first one is, um, I like the start. I really like the introduction of the protagonist in the memoir. That's just, it's obviously, it's Johan himself and uh, the inciting incident that, that starts his growth as a young man and his immigration to the United States. My only concern is um, uh, this last statement, bankrupted financially and morally at the, end of physical, at the point of physical collapse, he finally asks himself what went wrong. So Johan fights his way back to health. So um, you've told me, it sounds like you've told me already what happened. So I, I almost already know how the book is going to end. Um, that Johan fights his way back to health and, and back to financial and moral um, security. So there's, uh, if you want to follow sort of the fiction formula, I don't, I don't, there's not a, there's not a strong mystery here at the end. There is some hook, right? Uh, the, the idea of, um, uh, of a personal journey, overcoming adversity, the highs and lows of a personal life. Um, but you may want to think about um, how to recraft this so that you end on something that makes me want to purchase the book uh, with a hook of some kind. Now, um, describing your own book in great vivid prose almost sounds like you're self-complimenting yourself. That's probably going to turn off some of your browsers. Um, but I love the part about taking us on great, ad uh, great adventures and uh, reinforcing for us the frantic realities of war. Not your average rags to riches tale, finds meaning in life, articulates his journal with humble honesty, again complimenting yourself, and moving to seek something deeper in ourselves. Personal powerful story, complimenting yourself, uh, turmoil, excess, and return, which everyone will enjoy no matter their chosen path. So you're making an assumption for me, the reader, that I must enjoy this book. That's not a horrible presumptive close, um, but it is presumptive. You've got to be aware of that. Some people may finish the book and say, well, I didn't enjoy this, and, and, uh, and downvote your, uh, your book for that reason. So I think there's some things you might want to look at in the, as you review, Johan, this, um, this book description you've written. Let's take a look at your paperback book description. Okay, I've got nothing. So um, somehow uh, the, the paperback version of your book isn't showing any book description whatsoever. I think that's something you'll want to remedy as soon as you can. Also, while you're doing that, you probably want to remedy your book cover issue because I think that um, we could spend a lot of time talking about your book cover on the ebook side. But one thing we would all agree on is that it's certainly better than your paperback book cover. Thanks for sharing that, Johan. I appreciate that very much. Let's take a look at the next one. Let's see how much time we've got. I'm trying to go through these quickly. Okay, let's, let's see if we can do a couple more. Okay, sustainable beekeeping, surviving in the age of uh, CCD. I think that's colony collapse disorder. I was just reading a great article about it this morning in the paper. Okay, so there's more to beekeeping than simply keeping bees. Honeybees face threats from colony collapse disorder, systematic pesticides and GMO crops. It's been becoming more difficult to keep honeybees and next to impossible to keep those bees alive. How do we survive in this challenging age? Okay, hold it. Stop right there. So... Um, I've got conflict, right? The life of bees versus um, the the threat of colony collapse disorder and systematic pesticides, uh, and how do we survive in this challenging age? So, you, you if you stopped right here before we read any further with just this one, these two sentences, um, you've got a couple elements um, of 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 a hook. Um, so, Grant Gillard, small scale commercial beekeeper, shares his insight and philosophies, field tested ideas, and sustainable methods. All right, so now, wow, um, this is a long one. And I don't know if your uh, readers, Grant, are going to stick with you for this whole uh, review, I mean this whole uh, book description. This might be asking too much of an investment for someone who is, I, I certainly think your book cover is, is eye-catching, I like that. Um, so you've got a good strong momentum of interest going into your book description but we may have something that's a little bit too long here. Uh, I think you've got a lot of questions in here, which, or you've got a few questions here, which I like. There's another question. Um, and I think those are all good in that um, uh, they're asking the reader to go on a, a speculative journey with you and see if we can't find the answers together. Um, but I'm just worried a little bit about the length of your, uh, of your descript book description. Let's see what the paperback one looks like. All right, so... Wow, here's a, wow, that's one giant paragraph. Okay, 
I would submit to you that it's going to be very difficult for your uh, readers to stay interested enough to read that whole paragraph. And I'm just uh, changing. I want to see if there are any line breaks built into it. Oh, there are some ugly line breaks built into it. So I just changed the zoom on my screen. And it's one of the things you can't control as an author. You, it, it's hard to know. I mean, even Amazon can't control what particular zoom I have my screen set on in my browser, which I do, of course, by hitting control and then my, my mouse wheel. But it looks to me like um, either intentionally or unintentionally, you've got some hard returns at the end of each one of these lines. And this book description is, uh, is going to be, frankly, difficult for your browsers to navigate. Um, uh, you've clearly got uh, some breaks at the appropriate points between paragraphs. I think that, at the very least, you want to check out the uh, authormarketingclub.com tool, get yourself set up on a, a free membership, and then see if that can help you uh, uh, improve at least the formatting of this particular review. Um, you may also want to spend some time seeing if there aren't uh, some ways to cut down on the size of what you've written. Okay, great. Let's take a look at Sixth Street by uh, by Bruce. All right, so it's 1950s in Cleveland. Brian Wiseman never looks for trouble, but trouble finds him. It's a hot summer day when two bullies throw him down a ravine and toss his bike on top of him. A year later, Brian, now eight, is in the hospital dealing with a rare neurological disease caused by his fall. His disorder, dystonia, is cured by a series of operations. Between the surgeries, Brian and his friends deal with the bullies. Along the way, they meet Al Rosen and Herb Score of the Cleveland Indians and learn some lessons about life. Okay, so I've got the whole story. This is a complete synopsis of the book, and it looks like um, boy gets bullied, boy has problems, and boy comes out okay. So there's no mystery to me. You kind of told me how the book ends. Um, now, of course, I don't know if, if he's cured of his dystonia. Well, I guess he is cured of his dystonia. So there's not even a mystery there anymore for me. I wonder if I need to buy this book anymore. There's not a compelling reason for me. There's no, there's no emotional hook here at the end, although you have me in the first couple sentences, of why I should buy this book. Um, I definitely, we definitely meet Brian, the uh, protagonist. Um, we've definitely got the inciting incident when the bullies throw him down a ravine. Um, He's in the hospital dealing with a rare neurological disease caused by the fall. Okay, so right there I've got the conflict. I think I've got the conflict. Um, but now I wonder if with this book description I could go a little different direction and uh, uh, try to leave me with a, a good emotional hook about uh, maybe he's struggling to get better. Uh, I'm not certain why we introduce uh, Al and Herb in the last uh, sentence here. I wonder if there's a way to introduce them uh, earlier into the into the setting somehow uh, we've got a good we got of course we got 1950s in the Cleveland so that's a good setting element as well uh, but I would I would sort of go back to the fiction formula and I'd take a look at this particular description and see if there's some way that you can avoid telling me how the story ends and leave me with some question that um, uh, uh, brings me um, gives me a compelling reason to click on the add to cart buy this book right now because that's your goal for this page buy this book right now and okay great let's go on and take a look at one more uh, let's look at Kyle's book terror on arrival an apocalyptic science fiction novel I love science fiction I read it all the time my library is filled with science fiction on my Kindle and my first problem here is uh, here's my book description down here okay so um, I've got a show more button. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, so synopsis. I don't know if I want a synopsis. I don't really. I don't want you to tell me what happens with the book, but let's see what happens. Uh, Valanchinus was a planet billions of light years away from Earth that had a problem, an indigenous, insidious eating machine called the Chausik. This creature was legion and was poised to render the planet barren. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm getting an, an introduction, it looks like, maybe, to the antagonist. Okay. The native Chisao did not kill them. Instead, they relocated them to our planet back when there wasn't much more than primordial ooze. They didn't know what, if anything, would exist there. They put the creatures in suspended gravity, so whatever evolved would be advanced enough to either evict or escape them. Their calculations were slightly off. In the 21st century, they woke up, and the U.S. Air Force aqua horticulturalist with her Russian Spetsnaz bodyguard had to find a, had to find a way to stop them, along with her deft mentor, and an alien from Valentinus who wanted to correct the future dystopia, they had to find a way to stop the relentless Chausek that couldn't be killed. 
This is an adventure to try to stop Armageddon. But the question is, how? Okay, so um, I, I think I, I like the way you end with, uh, with the question, with an attempt to set the hook. Um, I, I, again, I'm not an editor, but I think that there may be some things that you can do to this book description that, um, you know, I, I don't, as having not read your book, I don't know what the inciting incident that starts the book. My guess is that, that your inciting incident might be when Aqua, I, uh, I assume that's her name, and, that, and Horticulturist is not her last name, but maybe her title, although I'm not certain. In any case, when your protagonist or someone discovers the, um, the Chowsec. So I might go back and rewrite this synopsis, remove the word synopsis, and re rewrite it. And, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't start my description with, Terror on Arrival is an apocalyptic science fiction novel by Kyle Robertson, because that information is supposed to be conveyed here. So this looks pretty apocalyptic to me, your book cover. It's got your author name at the top. It's strong, Terror on Arrival. I like your book cover. Um, it's got your title. So repeating that here in the book description uh, is not necessary in the Amazon world. There may be other worlds where it is, but it's not necessary here. I might go back and take a look at this synopsis and see if you can rewrite it more toward the formula that we talked about, which is um, protagonists, which could be the horticulturist and the spetsnaz, bodyguard, uh, have an inciting incident. Uh, the Chausik uh, eats their car, uh, making that up. Uh, and uh, the conflict is the Chausik doesn't stop eating. It heads down towards <clears throat> Miami and keeps eating. And uh, then maybe maybe some backstory is <coughs> excuse me is appropriate. I'm just worried that you may have too much backstory here, or maybe even I would say in the first and having not read your book, the first two paragraphs, if they don't actually occur as scenes in your book, or maybe they're the prologue, I'm wondering if the beginning, if there's too much information dumped in the very beginning of your, your book description. So I think that there are definitely some things you can do here. Uh, and I don't know if you have a print version. If you do, it's not connected to this page, so we, we can't see it very easily. So I hope that was helpful to everybody. If you've got any questions, uh, go ahead and throw them up on the screen. I am happy to answer them uh, as the best I can. Again, I am not a professional editor. I'm not a copywriter. Um, but I think that uh, most authors who have advanced to the stage where they've completed a book can probably do most of these things pretty well on their own as long as they know what they're aiming for. Um, I thank you very much for joining me. Uh, you may have seen, we'll go back to my slides, uh, you, you may have noticed this Book Fuel logo we've got here. Uh, our next presentation will probably, we'll start to shift our branding over towards Book Fuel, which is our new service. Um, they'll, I'll still be giving the presentations. We'll still keep them relevant to topics. Uh, for self-publishing authors, but I hope you'll join me in our next one. Our next one week, next week is actually we're going to go um, back and improve on a, a webinar we've done before, which is how to um, how to uh, essentially optimize your Amazon.com sales page. What are the five or six or seven things you've got to do? We just talked about one of them in great depth, getting a good book description, but there's some other things to do to your Amazon.com sales page to help you sell more books, and that's what we'll be talking about. No, yeah, two weeks from today. Thank you again, everybody, for joining me. Uh, you're welcome to send me an email, bill.vanorris.wavecloud.com, or call me uh, anytime if I can help. Uh, we want to help authors be successful, and um, I'm not kidding. I'll answer any email you want to send me. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. I appreciate it.